everybody. I am Pastor Joe. I'm Pastor Cliff. And welcome to Coffee with the Pastors, coming to you from Studio 44, the Henry Aaron Studio. Uh, Cliff, tell them about our wonderful sponsor. She's, uh, she's in Colombia, isn't she? Yes, she is. Actually left last week for Colombia. Uh, beautiful Gate Cafe, uh, one of the most unique cafes that you'll ever, ever enter. It's a great place for eating, coffee, tea, whatever you want. She has an international menu. And from what I understand, she's going to Colombia to help them set up a little coffee shop like that, which can actually take care and pay for minutes. She, she has that vision of setting these coffee shops up where basically making churches self-sufficient by running a coffee shop. They employ people and the church actually takes care of itself. It's a yeah. really sharp model playing off of what she has here. For so. years she has uh, taken portions of that are profit and she shares uh, the ministry of the month. But uh, going back to the place itself, it's just got a unique atmosphere. There's people in there meeting for Bible studies. Uh, old friends just the other week, two people hadn't seen each other in a long time, sat down over coffee. And uh, the coffee is great. Uh, they have what I like, strong, black, real coffee. And then they have all the food, food drinks you want. She's got a whole line of things on the wall she can put in there, and uh, people love them. Yeah, you can get all the candy drinks. All, yeah. Anything you want. It's a great place. Miss Corey is an exceptional young lady, and if you haven't tried it, you're missing out. Well said. Well said. Well, today we find ourselves in Psalm 71. Um, just to give you a perspective, what we try to do here at the church, if you use our online uh, portal, Tomoka Christian Church, you'll get pretty much a well-rounded, like right now I'm preaching second, first and second Corinthians, Cliff on Tuesdays preaching, Colossians, Colossians. Court will be preaching something different. We, we try to, so if, if I'm here, somebody else will be in the Old Testament, somebody else will be preaching on the life of Jesus. We try to give you a balanced diet through all of our opportunities. So you may or may not listen or watch everything, but it is there. And so we started doing psalms, and uh, my goodness, uh, we're almost halfway through it. I, I'm noticing that today. We're getting, yeah. uh, we're getting older we're getting and older. There. Uh, so Psalm 71 is kind of a long run here. You want to take the opening section, Cliff? Well, <clears throat> basically looking at this, it sounds a whole lot like the other psalms that we've written. However, there's no designation that David wrote this psalm. There's every indication that somebody like us, old, wrote this. I'll get into that in a minute. Yeah. If you read Psalms 31, 1 through 3a, same opening on this and the same unknown author. So again, these are just hints you can pick up about it. There's a key word here. Yeah, that, if you don't know, there are Psalms written by Moses. There's some written by the Asaph, the sons of Asaph, and some we don't know. And next week is Solomon. Right. Wrote Psalm 72. This looks not at an immediate need how at the beginning uh, in verse 3 it says I can always go to you that's the implication when you look at the, the uh, Hebrew in that it's actually what we would use the word continually so what the writer is talking about from an old age standpoint is that he has always been able to go to God mm. God has always been able, been his refuge. God has always protected him. And verse 5, you have been. From birth, I have relied on you. Verse 14, I will always hope. Uh, I wrote my Bible, Caleb. Uh, here's a guy that all of his life lived in a hope, and he was 85 years old before he actually got the fulfillment of his hope, which didn't stop him. And today, so often, when people say at 65, well, I've retired, uh, they're sitting down. They're not, a, not going through the experiences that they've got. So <coughs> this is a fellow that has walked with God. He's seen the best of life, the worst of life, and God has been the one sure foundation. Yeah. So that's well, he I'm starts right. off there, you know, uh, I've taken refuge in God, and that phrase that I talked about this weekend uh, let me never be put to shame. Right. This idea of shame is is written throughout uh, Scripture, and I 
I think a lot of what we see in our society today, it comes out as arrogance, it comes out as protest, it comes out as uh, all this stuff. But I'm not trying to pick on any particular group because it's everywhere. But I, I think a lot of that comes out of the fact that there's unresolved shame in their life right. and they end up actually just embracing it. Yeah, I'll just embrace my shame and go all in and then I'll feel better about it. Well, you do for a while until you go to bed at night and uh, rescue me, deliver me, uh, turn, your, turn my ear to you, you right. gotta save me, you are my rock, uh, but again, he, it's it's more of a you've been it you've done it um, and I just want you to know that I'm staying true I'm staying right. faithful um, you know you may be younger but still okay well Lord I trusted you on that was test number two and I I trusted you there now let's go on to number three it doesn't matter where you're at in the order it's I still trust you you know there's an old saying that says the one thing we learn from from history is that we don't learn from history mm. and too many times and I'll just put it back on me too many times when I'm faced something uh, I act like it's something new uh, you go through the being terrified wondering what you're gonna do uh, pulling your hair out the whole nine yards and then all of a sudden it comes to you wait a minute this is a familiar territory God has already walked me through this area and that is the beauty of walking with the Lord continually. Uh, he addresses it down here as Sovereign Lord, which is the key, guys. God is in charge. God has the destiny of this world in his hands. He has our destiny. And that, yeah, Sovereign, it means Lord over all. All. And again, we live in a society and, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're a corporate executive uh, trying to climb the ladder or you're a blue-haired person standing out protesting um, the war somewhere. Um, it's still this idea that I, I'm sovereign. I'm the one that is in charge of my life. And I guess, you know, in some ways as an American, you are. You have every right to do that, but that doesn't make you sovereign. Well, also, when I think about the protesters, I'm going to give them a benefit of doubt. Let's just say that a lot of them began with some form of truth. Hmm. But the problem yeah. is, I don't see this, this generation, and I'll put it on them, that they really search out to make sure the truth that they're claiming is real truth. Uh, they depend more on what somebody says to them, which is a real problem when you don't know what the truth is, you're going to believe just about anything to try to get to where you want to get. Uh, most of the time, people have an end of where they want to be. They don't have any idea how they're going to get there. Yeah. And they don't trust. Well, you know, this is nothing new. I mean, they were protesting yeah. in Vietnam. They were protesting... Um, during World War II, there were exactly. people protesting during the Civil War, I'm sure. Um, you know, there were people trying to make peace during the Revolutionary War. Uh, it, there's always there's always something you could protest about, um, but why not go do something about it? Why not let God be sovereign and then say, you know what, God, you're in control. I'll, I'll just keep it. I'm very pro-life. Cliff and I, all of us are very pro-life. So, but that means nothing if all we do is talk about it. We're supporting pregnancy crisis centers, we're buying diapers, we're, we're helping people adopt children. I can't change the whole world, but with my belief system, I can do something. And most of the time, protesters just want to destroy things or tear down ideas. They really don't have a solution. No, and that's a big problem. I, I remember many years ago I was reading about I kept hearing about a think tank, a think tank, think tank. So I did some investigation, and basically in a think tank, they just simply talk about problems. And from that think tank, they never come out of it saying, let's do A for this problem, A, B for this problem. It's just talking about issues. And you know, the one problem we have is when we talk about issues, they get bigger. 
Right. That's why the dark is so scary. You don't know what's there, and in your mind, you think up all kinds of stuff in there. It's the same thing with looking at problems in the world. It's not after a solution, not how I can help. It's this is the problem, and I'm just going to make a noise to somebody else decide. And I'll decide whether I like what they're going to do. Right. And not. some people never, that's their whole life is just protesting. And again, uh -huh. I feel the same way about Christians that tell me they're pro-life, yeah. but then they don't put their money down. They're not buying diapers. They don't step up to adopt or help people adopt. We're, that's the same thing. We're, we're just protesters. We're just not as vocal about it. A lot of stuff I talked about this weekend, though, Cliff, that word shame is everywhere. Yeah. And then down in verse 14, uh, but as for me, I will always have hope. Yeah, exactly. You tell them about hope. I talked about it this weekend. <laughs> hope is something based in something that's sure. Uh, I realize hope uh, can be something that you may have in your mind, but you can't put your fingers on it. But it's based in a sure thing. Uh, our hope as a Christian is in Jesus Christ and what he said. Because of what he said, he's accountable. And he's been accountable for generation after generation with this written word. But the accountability factor is simply this. When this word, any one small part, ceases to be true, then he has no credibility. That's correct. And he has put out, and then not only put out his word, then his actions have followed his word up. And so he has a continual a uh, thousand batting average, you might say. So I have hope because have God hope. is consistent, not exactly. because I am. <clears throat> right. And it's in His righteousness that we have that hope. And in our listen, at any age, you can look back and see where God has rescued you. you it, 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 even if you don't have that relationship with the Lord, uh, you can look back in your life when you say, wow, man, I was almost in a wreck and just, most people call it, just by luck, the car did this. Right. Well, guys, there's no such thing as, as luck. Everything's guided by God. And in the life of an unbeliever, everything's going to happen in your life. And listen, I know that I was 29 before I became the great saint that I am today. Uh, and I know that God puts stuff in my life that confused me because I, I didn't know why it happened. I just couldn't explain it. I'm talking about good stuff, escapes, uh, blessings, things that I wasn't expecting. It was like God just dangling a carrot in front of my face saying, hey, look up, look at this, because God wants a relationship. Well, he knew you were going to make a decision. Exactly. I mean, that's the one part of predestination I do agree with. Right. God knows the decisions you're going to make ahead exactly. of time. And he is putting it that, he, and you know, chances are somebody listening today is, is going to say, you know, just the other day I was thinking, how did this happen and why? Well, God being sovereign is why. Uh, that's, that's the whole thing. Uh, but there's one more hope here. Yeah. This is an old guy. Everybody's going to die. The Bible says it's appointed unto man wants to die. You go over into verse 20, he said, You will restore my life again, and from the depths of the earth, you will bring me up again. Mm -hmm. Listen, the <laughs> end of your life is not in that graveyard. And so many times I've heard people say, standing in the graveyard, well, we are putting his body the rest. We're putting old Cliff or old souls. Uh, that's just a body that's going to decay in the grave. Uh, we have a living hope. We talked about hope. Our hope is living. Our life is not over when it dies. It basically begins, but the challenge is there's only two roads. One towards Christ and one away from Him. And the choice of those roads have to be made right now today, while we're living in the region. And I know we're talking, you know, sort of to the choir, but maybe yeah. not everybody here has accepted Jesus. But this whole idea is nothing new. Adam knew this. Yeah. 
Adam and Eve understood that there was a spiritual life to follow the physical life. They understood that. And it's passed down. It's in every, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Assyrians. They all talk about this afterlife. It's only been in the last 300 years that man has become so enlightened and humanism has taken over that the atheist worldviews kicked in this idea that this is all there is. Right. And that's why you get all you can get. Grab the money, grab the girls, grab the drugs, grab whatever. Uh, um, that's pure humanism. Everybody, even though they didn't have the story quite right, the ancient Egyptians knew there was an afterlife. Yes, they did. Everybody knows this, except brilliant modern man who's decided that they've self-evolved and will self-decline, which is going to be a sad day for a lot of people. Uh, but Cliff, I like, I, I thought you would go here first, but you went to 20. I, I go to 18. Okay. Even when I'm old and gray, well, you know. Do not forsake me, God, till I declare your power to the next generation. Yeah. Now listen, this is exactly what I preached on this weekend. I could have done my whole sermon that I preached from 2 Corinthians 4 from Psalm 71. Um, but God, I got one job to do, and the older we get, we have got to invest in the next generation. Exactly. Um, it's, I mean, right now we're investing in 40-year-olds, we're investing in 20-year-olds, because they're the church. Um, it's really a matter of time for us. Well, you know, the scriptures record that the older prophets discovered, and, and the apostles discovered, each in their generation, that what they were doing was not for them, mm -hmm. but was for the generations to come. Yep. And I think sometimes we forget that. We're, we're laying ground, like every Sunday, we prepare here at Tomoka. Uh, we prepare for everybody, but basically we're prepared for the person that's never been here. Correct. So that when that person walks in, their experience, is they're not going to be distracted from worship. So all of our lives, if we live preparing for those that follow us just like you wanted the best for your kids I want the best for mine you know I've been told all the time your boys are much smarter that doesn't make me angry I'm just very happy you know they're making good money one day they can take care of me you exactly know, and, you know exactly but, and really that's what we want it's it's a selfish struggle sometimes and you guys don't know who I'm going to talk about but this guy named Wayne Smith who was a legend in the Christian church in Lexington. And Wayne had a church of, I don't know, four or 5,000 people back in the 70s. Wow. And Wayne was like the guy, spoke everywhere, he was funny, uh, he had like five jokes, but he, he told them well. Uh, but we had a lot of fun with Wayne. Um, but when Wayne retired, he transitioned, within about a year, the church went from 5,000 to 8,000. And Wayne said, uh, this is the hardest thing I ever did. And he said, how could I not be excited that 3,000 people accepted Christ? But he said, it was still tough on my ego. Yeah. And, but guys, we that are older, we got to want these kids to succeed. Yeah. We want them mm -hmm. to flourish. Go plant that next church that's going to change that city. And, or be the guy to follow me and take it to the next level. We'll deal with our egos. Yeah. We'll, we'll eventually, God will deal with that. But but if we don't want the best for the future of the church, we don't get it. We've missed what we're all about. And that's the story from Christ on the cross, actually. The story from God from the garden. He could have wiped out Adam and Eve when they sinned. But he made that first sacrifice of animals and covered it. Okay, guys, this is going to be a temporary situation. Yeah. And from the garden, God has cared and loved and sought his people. Uh, uh, you know, we were just talking about the new Gen Z Bible. Uh, that is a way to reach a generation that's not being reached. And, and we, we've we got to figure out how to reach that generation. Different language. It may be done, it may be done through videos. It, 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 doesn't matter it doesn't matter how it gets done. It's so that it's the message of the Bible and the scripture, not exactly the words that you use. 
But what we did talk about before we went on air here <clears throat> is the fact that he, the two of us aren't going to be the one to reach that generation. Right. Exactly. But we've got these 20 and 25 year olds that we get to keep training. Right. They can be the ones to reach. Exactly. Not not that we don't want to, but right. I mean, it was a weird feeling to me when I realized one day I thought they, I was like a dad figure, and I realized I was a grandfather figure. That was a weird. Uh, that was a weird moment. For <clears throat> well, me. you have a great, you have a great grandfather feeling coming up. That that. That's true. You know, it just keeps going, doesn't it? You know, when my uh, my grandfather was, uh, he he really thought a lot of you. It's <laughs> like your grandfather. <laughs> Well, the last part talks about the guy says, I'm just going to keep on praising you. And yeah. I think that's uh, really the, the way to finish this. Uh, Cliff, why don't you do that part, and then I'll pray us out. Well, I, I was looking at this. They, or this writer is talking about he's going to worship you with song, the harp. He's going to talk about the faithfulness of God. He's going to use musical instruments, which is worship. Then he says, my lips are going to shout for joy. I'm going to sing. I'm going to... I know you have delivered me. Then my tongue will tell of your righteous acts all day long. For those who wanted to harm me have been put to shame and in conclusion. The message I get out of that is this. Too many times I'll throw it back on me. I'll go through something, pray, ask different people, pray for me, pray for me. And then when God brings me through that, it's forgotten about. I don't go say, hey, Joe, remember when you were praying about this? Guess what? Yada, 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 which is an encouragement to you. And it's how we share our experience. God may not be delivering you at that moment, but when people around you are being delivered by God, you know you're in line and that he's going to hear your prayer. And so that's how we spread this. And it's also a witness to those people that don't have a relationship with God and have nothing to place their hope in. And the one thing you were talking about a while ago, when you suck the hope out of life, the next thing that happens is people take their life. And we're at an all-time high at every Well, age they'll take their life or they'll incapacitate bury, it so badly. Life, that, exactly. yeah. Bury it, sex, alcohol, something. So... Uh, a great song and a great witness uh, of what old guys ought to be doing. We ought to be out there talking and sharing with people and uh, just being available. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, God, we thank you um, that you have been faithful. You've been our rock. You've been our redeemer. You've protected us. You've forgiven us for our shame. You've given us a chance to teach younger people. You've given us a chance to shout your praise. And Lord, we, uh, we have a job to do. We just want to keep doing it. We want to be faithful to the calling you have on us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. See you next week. Thank you, guys.